Coming up on Book TV's Afterwards, Fox News host Tucker Carlson offers his thoughts on elitism in America. He's interviewed by Matt Schlapp, chair of the American Conservative Union. Afterwards is a weekly interview program with relevant guest hosts interviewing top nonfiction authors about their latest work. Great to be here with Tucker Carlson. Matt Schlapp. Tucker, and gentlemen. I'm not really used to this. The table has been turned. I it's get a ask, lot easier to ask the questions. I get to ask you questions. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I did stay up late and really enjoyed your book. Well, thank you. Because uh, what I find about good writing is that you uh, you pick it up quickly, and you don't think about it as being onerous. You just kind of keep plowing through it, which uh, well, nobody is, needs more to read. I think. Very few books you can read all at once, and I did, which was which was a great thing, and I think thank a good you. testament to your writing. So I had the first question was, I look at the cover art, right? Because yeah. that's how we all, we're all visual these days, right? Wait, so you're Everything's saying a you meme. can judge a book by its cover? <laughs> you can't. I'm going to hope to. Okay. So I looked at the cover, and you have certain people on the cover. So I expected this book to be your typical, hey, the Republican Party is sometimes off track, a little weak. You get into that. But you didn't necessarily go into, you know, personal criticisms or professional criticisms on Republican leaders so much. It was really much bigger than that. How did you pick who was on the cover? Or did an artist just pick it? Yeah, I mean, I had, I'm not a visual, I'm a word yeah. person, so I don't think in pictures. It's weird, I work in TV, and that's why my hair's always messed up. But um, I didn't have a huge role in that. Yeah. They kind of picked the people to appear on the cover. I haven't even looked carefully at who's on the cover. That's awesome. That's how, that's dysle- a good answer, that's how dyslexic I am, actually. But <laughs> no, it's not a partisan book. I've never been interested in partisan politics, especially. Yeah. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I think it's necessary. I think it's democratic, but it um, it's not of great interest to me. I wanted to make the case that the real debate is not about the parties. Right. And I think this last election, the 2016 election, made that clear. It's a debate between different strata in society, the people yes. who are benefiting from the current arrangement and the people who are not. And why wouldn't that be the dividing line? And that's really what it is. Despite all the attempts to obscure that, that's really what we're fighting over, which is who benefits from the systems that we have in place. Yeah, it was bigger ideas than just the parties, which was really refreshing because we get so much into red wave, blue wave, you know. Well, the whole reason hat. Trump got elected is because the normal rules became obsolete. Thank God. And the par- and that's exactly right. That's how that's how I feel. I mean, whatever you think of Trump, we needed a realignment along lines that made sense. Yeah. And the Republican Party needed to become a middle class party, and it wasn't. And now it increasingly is. The leadership of the party doesn't want it to be, obviously. They wanted to remain what they always have been, which right. is the party of management. But that's now the Democratic Party. It's the party of rich people. Yeah. That's not the party of my childhood. By the way, when I was growing up, people would say the Republican Party was the country club party. And right. all Republicans like my family would be like, well, no, it's not. But of course it was. Yeah. And now, you know, pick a country club. Go to the Round Hill Country Club in Greenwich and just sort of do an informal survey in the bar. Who'd you vote for? Yeah. And it's a Hillary club now so uh the other thing that was interesting about you i didn't know you grew up in california yeah tell me about california did that have a real impact on your philosophy on politics oh, or? yeah it had a huge effect i grew up in california i was born in san francisco and lived in los angeles and then really grew up in la jolla which is in san diego county I mean, talk about the toniest of tony places la jolla yeah and i'm by the yeah. way i mean i i never i'm often wrong i never want to be false so i'm yeah, not of course. I hope I'm not pretending to be, you know, the siren of the middle class or giving you the view from coal country. Sure. I, I'm not from there. Yeah. I'm from the world that I'm writing about, which is the world of, you know, well-educated and affluent, and the people making most of right. the decisions. That's who I grew up around, who I've always lived around. And so I do have a pretty good sense of their attitude. Of course like you do. a very yeah. good sense of them. Um, but California affected me in a bunch of ways. My family got to California, you know, in the, in the 1850s. Not that long ago by East Coast standards, but by West Coast standards, you know, they never stopped talking about it. They're very proud to be from California. Mm-hmm. And so I grew up bombarded with and absorbing, internalizing, believing all this propaganda about how this was the greatest state ever. Right. This was kind of the end point of human civilization. Sure. This was the apogee. This is as good as it gets. It might end there. It actually might end so, there. It literally ends there. By the way, there's the ocean. So like, it doesn't get any better That's or right. go any further than this. And, and I really believe that. And it was demonstrable. It was the nicest state. You know, I was born in 1969. In 1980, when I was in fifth grade or whatever, you know, I had the best infrastructure, the largest middle class, the best schools, obviously the best weather, the most attractive people, a roaring economy. I mean, it really was as good as it ever got in America. And now, 2018, 38 years later, it has the most poverty and it has some of the worst schools. I think it's 48th 
something around there in mm-hmm. schools. Terrible. You can't use the schools in most places in California. It has the highest percentage of welfare recipients. It's you know got crumbling infrastructure. I mean, it's it's too crowded. It's dirty, physically unclean. It's like what happened? If there's not a lesson there, then I you know then we're just not paying attention. And there are a bunch. So of how lessons. many of like in your family and with your friends? Were you unique to walk out of that with a conservative, limited government, constitutional type viewpoint, or was there a lot more people than like that than? No, I mean there were a ton think. of. I mean Ronald Reagan was from California. Sure, uh, yeah. and certainly had his career in California. He was the governor of the state, I think, when I was born. And um, he, you know, California. I went to Reagan's last rally in 1980, the day before the election. Mm-hmm. It was the Del Mar racetrack in San Diego County, and that was Reagan country. All the bumper stickers said. So there were. I mean, it was a conservative state. So, well, let me say it a different way. So then, has California... Bill Clinton did a lot better in West Virginia than he did in California in the that's, 92 election. That's exactly right. Right? Yes, yeah, so, totally right. So the California of today, vis-a-vis the California of your childhood, seems like a different place then. It does. San Francisco, we're, we're seeing all these terrible pictures of the drug paraphernalia and just right. the onslaught of homeless folks, and this just doesn't seem recognizable. Well, so the, the conventional critique of California is true which is that what really changed was party idea. It went from a Republican state to a Democratic state, a one-party state, in effect. And that's true. But that's not what interests me as much, because I think politics is an outgrowth of, of deeper things, mostly economic trends. Right. And we, in general, have given up on seeing the world through an economic lens, mm-hmm. which is a shame, because I don't think economics is the, is the explainer of everything, but I think how much you make is a huge part of the life that you live and a huge part of the decisions that you make. Economics really is central to most people's lives. It's not central to my life because I make a lot of money, so I don't yeah. know what gas prices are actually. Right. But if you're making 80 grand a year and living in Orange County, it's a really meaningful question. So we have ignored that. And what I am struck by when I return to California, I spent last week there, is how much the economics of the state have changed. So it really, and this is not a demographic, que- this is not a racial question or anything like that. It's a question of who is benefiting from the economy. And in that sense, strictly in that sense, it's very much a Latin American arrangement where you have the richest people in the world live in California. Bel Air is the richest neighborhood on planet Earth and a beautiful place. I stayed there with friends when I was there. And then you have, you know, 20 minutes away, people living on the sidewalk. What does that remind you of? Well, it reminds you of Caracas, actually. It reminds you of a Latin American social and economic structure where there's no middle class, it's pyramid-shaped. And the point I'm making is not that that's unfair. I mean, theologians can debate whether that's fair or not. I'm not a theologian. I'm an Episcopalian. It's the opposite, basically, of a theologian. <laughs> I'm making the case rooted in observable reality that that is an unstable system right. in a democracy. If you give everybody the vote, mm-hmm. but only a small percentage share in the spoils, everybody else is going to be angry And they're going to punish you with the political power they have, and they're going to elect populists. Populism is always a red alert that something is wrong in your Mm -hmm. democracy. Donald Trump's election is a warning, whatever you think of Trump, pro or con, to the rest of us, that this is going in the wrong direction. The population could not get the attention of policymakers, so they elected Trump Mm -hmm. as to sort of break the glass in case of emergency. Okay, you're not listening to me. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to elect this orange Mm -hmm. guy. Maybe that'll get your attention. That's right. And they refuse to accept the message. So what happens if they continue to refuse to change? You know, you're going to wind up with a a series of populists, so they may be left-wing populists, they may be right-wing, but it almost doesn't matter, actually. But you're going to wind up with a huge amount of volatility in your political system, and it's going to wreck the country. So it's really important to respond or just suspend democracy. That's your other option. You say, you know what, this whole one-man, one-vote thing, it's not working. We don't have a population that can support it. They're not wise enough to make good decisions. So we're going to revert to oligarchy, and I'm sorry this experiment was great. 250 years, great run. Now we're running everything. Shh, adults are talking. You no longer have a voice. That is an option. It would take a civil war to get there, but that, I mean, if we're being honest about it, you could do that, or you can think hard about how to enfranchise everybody. Or you could listen. Yeah, and listen, which is the first step. Acknowledge the problem. Think deeply about the solution. That's what leaders who care about their people would already be doing, but they don't care. And that's the real truth. They don't care. So let's, there's so many places to go, and especially your, the statistics you pull out in the book, which are really actually pretty alarming to yeah. see, you know, the cold truth of the fact that the percentage of uh, middle class who are, you know, pulling down the income in this country has dropped 20 points yeah. over the course of the last 50 years or so. That's a staggering 
number to, to oh, think that the middle class really is. We say it's a vanishing middle class, but you can actually see it in the numbers. That's going to have a political impact. This should be the largest percentage in society. It has to be. Yeah. You can't have a functioning democracy for the reasons just noted without a robust and independent bourgeoisie, middle class, mm-hmm. period. It's just the system does not work. If we could talk to the people who wrote the founding documents, they would say it's a prerequisite for the system to work. And so what I was really struck by in writing the book and doing research for the book was that the middle class in the United States became a minority for the first time in living history in 2015. Yeah. This is a huge story. The middle class is now the minority in the country. It's increasingly a country of rich and poor. Why is that not the headline? It was, And I'm in the news business, so you'd think I would remember it. That didn't move on the AP wire. I didn't read that anywhere. Nobody noticed because nobody cared because the people writing the stories are from exactly the same class as the people benefiting from our current economic arrangement. So that's, that's why I really thought, wow, this is, it's not a conspiracy of intent. It's a conspiracy of like-mindedness. So everybody making the decisions, everyone writing about the decisions is from exactly the same world. That's what right. world is that? It's my world. And it's a world where nobody you know is making less than after the financial crisis. Mm-hmm. The rest of the country is much poorer. Drive from D.C. to Pittsburgh, and you drive through towns of 10,000 people with no work, no car dealership. That's like, right. What, where'd all the businesses go? They died because the economy died, and it never fully recovered. And the government told, shut down, literally shut down some of those car dealerships. Exactly. It got a little But But crazy. you live here. You know this is the richest know. metropolitan area in the country. The core of our economy is the federal budget. Our economy is based on the federal budget, which expands without any... That's slow right. down since Pearl Harbor to now, but you just don't have any sense of how poor America is. Yeah. This is not the rich country we always talk about. It's drive around it. I like to fish. I mean, I'm just being honest. I like yeah. to fly fish and I hunt. So I'm in rural America a lot. If it weren't for that, I would have no tangible sense of what this right. country's like. I know I sound like, you know, Tolstoy writing You're out with the honest. structure. I'm, I'm being honest. Like, yeah. I wouldn't, how the hell would I know? Look, we know what it is in the swamp. I mean, I've never had a year where the traffic got better. The You've traffic doesn't had, get better. Right? The entrees never get cheaper. That's right. The schools become more expensive every right. year and harder to get into. The concentration of wealth in this city, and no one ever notes it here, just gets m- more profound every year. I mean, the D.C. that I moved to when I was 15 was a, a completely middle-class city. And the rich people who, I mean, we lived in Georgetown at yeah. 31st and N, right in the middle of the city. Claiborne Pell lived right down the street. He was a Democratic senator from Rhode Island. Pell Grants. The Pell Grants. Mm-hmm. I, know, I know the family. Yeah. They're rich. It's inherited mm-hmm. money. Claiborne Pell drove a K car with bumper stickers all over it and a, you know, masking tape holding the bumper on. I mean, he, he really went out of his way to pose as an ordinary person mm-hmm. because you kind of had to. There was no ostentation in D.C. at yeah. all. Well, that's changed. That's changed. Yeah. And that's a measure of how out of touch the city is because we're rubbing it in the faces of the rest of the country. Well, you go through this in the book where you talk about, I know that the, the suburbs and the zip codes surrounding D.C. are now some of the toniest, yeah. the highest ranked uh, wealth per capita. But you also talk about the, these top counties and zip codes yes. and the high percentage that no longer vote Republican actually voted for Hillary. Of course. Which is, to a lot of people, shocking because the conservative movement or the Republican Party, that's supposed to be the rich man's party, right? It's totally true. And the, I, I mean, again, I'm not pretending to be a savant. This is all very obvious in retrospect. It was not obvious to me at the time. I was fishing in western Maine near the Canadian border with a friend of mine who is a really smart guy but not you know, high school education vet. And I said to him in the summer of 15, who are you going to support? And he's obviously... You know, he's a gun guy, so he's a conservative, of course. And he said, I'm either going to support Bernie Sanders or Donald Trump. <laughs> and this is a smart I, I person. know this. Okay, so, but I, I was like, so those were not categories that I understood as real categories. And I, but I know this guy very well. He's a very close friend of mine. So I was like, what is that? And he goes, well, they're basically saying the same thing. The system is rigged and, you know, it shouldn't be in a democracy. And I'm mad about it. I was like, What? Bernie Sanders? And so that's when I began to realize this was not a conventional race. It was a race that reflected the actual sentiments of people. Most people are very much for populist economics. No one I know is. Yeah. They're all completely brainwashed by libertarian economics, right. the Chamber of Commerce, and all this stuff, which, I mean, how honest do you want to be? I'd like to be pretty okay, honest. Okay, so I look at these it's numbers. Not playing. I've got four <laughs> kids, and... 
you know, so I have some sense of what young people think, I guess. At least By the way, C SPAN can't fire me. No, they can't. They can't fire you. No, so. but look, you look at these numbers, and it's like half of all young people prefer socialism to capitalism. And if you're me on the cusp of 50, grew up during the Cold War, that's you're like, that's repugnant. Socialism, really? The religious faith posing as an economic system that enslaved half the world for my whole childhood? Yeah. Like, it's, it, bit, to me, it's like, well, we're for Nazism. It's like, what? It's disgusting. So if you're a middle-aged conservative like me, you're like, well, it's our school system. It's just terrible at brainwashing the kids. By the way, it's totally true. Mm -hmm. We put the dumbest people in charge of educating our kids. There's Mm -hmm. no doubt about that. And we spend the most money. And we spend the most money. But it's not just that. I mean, like, let's be real here. What's really going on, it's not that kids are believing everything they're told by their mediocre professors. It's that they look around and they're like, wait, I'm from a middle-class family or upper middle-class family, but I can't afford rent in New York City. And Mm -hmm. I can't afford to buy a car much less a house, much less get married. I'm delaying marriage and childbirth till I'm 35 because I have no choice. How exactly is capitalism working for me? It's not. And the rest of us are like, oh, shut up, kids. You just don't understand. Well, really, because if we cared about preserving capitalism, and I do because I think it works, we would think deeply about how it's not working for young people. And we're not. And so once you understand that, then you're like, of course Bernie Sanders is popular. Of course Trump's right. attack on the hedge funds was popular. Like, it all makes sense because why yeah. wouldn't they think that? The system is not working for them. Like, so I don't know if your kids are old enough, but when your first child graduates from college, I'm sure the kid's are going to come to you and be like, I want to live in downtown D.C. I want to live in New York City. I want to live in the west side of L.A. I can't make rent. And you're like, but you went to Vanderbilt. You know, you went to Catholic school for 12 years at high expense. You go to this expensive college, and you can't make enough. As a well-connected person from an upper-middle-class family, you can't make enough to pay rent? Like, what? Mm -hmm. Then you'll call your friends and be like, hey, are you supporting your daughter for the first? Yep, every one of them is. Yeah. Why? Because they can't support themselves because the economy won't support them. I'm not sure whose fault that is. I'm not sure how to fix it. I'm positive that's a terrible problem that will wreck the country if we don't get hold of it. Yeah, young people, if they don't feel like they have like an opportunity, that, that, if they think there's no chance they're going to do as well as their own parents did, they're going to become radical. That's right. And that's what's happening. So you had this recent Gallup poll that said something like 57% of Democrats are okay with the idea of being called a socialist party. Yeah. Whereas if you went, you went back into the 40s or the 50s, it would have been in the teens. I mean, there was socialism was always relevant in our political dialogue, but it was a pretty skinny uh, fringe idea. Except during the progressive era. Yeah. See, this is the root of everything. This is, and I, my concern is that Trump hasn't thought deeply enough about a lot of the things that he's saying and that he doesn't have enough support in Washington to get any of them done. That's a separate conversation. But this moment mirrors the progressive era almost precisely. You have a brand new technology, you know, the steam engine, which creates mm-hmm. industrialization and uproots everyone from the farms and moves them to cities, and it's totally transformative but also terribly disruptive, and you have a lot of social chaos. And all of a sudden, a lot of people find themselves at the mercy of their employers. They have no power. Their employers have less power. And they start to become politically radical. At the exact same moment, we have record high levels of immigration, people from other countries coming in to staff the factories. That's a hotbed of radicalism. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, you have like the IWW, the Industrial Workers of the World, the Wobblies, who are basically communists. Right. And they're getting traction, and bombs are going off. There's all this Mm -hmm. drama going on. Into that steps this guy from the ruling class, Teddy Roosevelt, Who's like, I support capitalism, I'm deeply conservative, and in order to preserve capitalism, I'm going to rein it in, which he does by trust busting, Mm -hmm. and by creating all these new federal regulations around products of Pure Food and Drug Act, all this stuff. And by doing that, he calms things down and allows capitalism to proceed apace for the next hundred years. The Romanovs do not respond this way. And they're like, hey, shut up, serfs. And the next thing they know, in a hole in the ground. they're getting executed and thrown right. into a mine shaft. Mm-hmm. And you have 70 years of Bolshevism that mm-hmm. enslaves the whole population. So what does that have in common with the current moment? Everything. You have a brand new technology that's overturning the economy and the social order. It's called the digital revolution. There's a huge cost to that. We never acknowledge it. People hate change. We're getting it at a pace that is not sustainable. And then you have the economic changes noted that are gravely disempowering the average person. The value of labor is just plummeting. We have record levels of immigration and all the predictable instability as a result. That's why Trump gets elected. But somebody needs to get some of these forces, the forces of technology, under control or else you're going to have a revolution. I don't want a revolution. You write a lot about that and about the CEOs. I want to ask you one question before we transition to that. Donald Trump, 
is he a transitional political figure yes. or is he a transformational political figure? Ah, that, I don't know Is how. he Teddy Roosevelt or is this just like an emergency break that takes place over a period of some years and then we're right back with some of the problems. You know, I've thought have. a lot about it. I don't, you know, and it's hard to know because we're right in the middle of it. Yeah. And it's hard to see the outlines clearly when they're right there. It's and, not a fair question, but I still ask. Well, no, it's actually, it's, I, I just had lunch all about this with a friend of mine who's very much smarter than I talking about this exact question. I think you just said he was smarter than me, too. I'm pretty No, sure. he's not smarter than you, but he's <laughs> definitely smarter than I am. And we were just talking about this exact thing. My sense is that one of the reasons that Trump can be frustrating to watch is because he's not a conventional politician in the following sense. A conventional politician is measured by the degree to which he achieves the things he promised on the campaign. So Trump's problem is that nobody in D.C. agrees with him at all, including most of the people who work in his... And they hate him. They hate him, including most executive branch employees. That's a problem. Including some people who work for him, even political jobs. Big time. Mm -hmm. Most of them. I don't know if they hate him, but they're not fully on board and they undercut Mm -hmm. him. And they don't agree with his ideas. And so Trump comes to Washington promising to build a wall, for example. You know what I mean? Or get... Healthcare prices under control or doing the things or, you know, rein in the finance sector. You know, let's get rid of these dumb loopholes like carried interest. Like, what is that? He can't achieve any of that because no one is on board to help him. And he doesn't know a lot about the system and hasn't learned, honestly, very much about it. So that's frustrating to watch. So if you're judging Trump by the normal metrics you would use to judge a politician, this is a failure. But maybe there's maybe Trump has another role. Maybe Trump's job his unique contribution to our politics is to be the guy who identifies the problem. And at that, Trump is both a genius totally. and he's incredibly brave. So Trump does this thing where he comes in and he's like, why are we doing it this way? And he'll just ask these kind of super simple questions that nobody can answer because the answers either implicate them so completely they yeah. can't admit it or they don't really have it. You know, why are we still in NATO? Right. I thought we were in NATO to prevent the Soviets from invading Europe, but the Soviets don't exist and haven't for 25 years. So why do we still have NATO? And everyone's like, they scratch, shut up. They scratch their head because he asked these questions that actually they're pretty basic questions you should have the answer to. And it makes the room be quiet. They're the essential questions. Right. Like, why don't we have a border? Yeah. Uh, shut up. What are you, a racist? Or yeah. why don't we have no? Shut up. What are you in Putin's pocket? And it's like, okay, whatever. I don't really care, actually, what Trump is like as a person. I want to know what the answer is. What is the answer, Mr. Genius Guy? Right. Mr. HBS McKinsey vet? Like, tell right. me. What is Smartest man in the world. Why are right. we still in NATO? Yeah. I'm not against NATO, but why don't you answer the question? They can't. And it's almost like when your kids go through that why phase where, like, Mommy, why is this? And you're like, there's a good reason, son. Yeah. But but why? And you're like, shh. You know, mommy's having a glass of wine. Stop asking questions. I'm still in this phase. I understand exactly <laughs> what you're talking about completely. But look, the you're thing... You're getting I, me spun up, man. The way I look at this is that he's an entrepreneur, right? And if you deal with... I've dealt a lot with, you know, billionaire conservative donors over the mm-hmm. decades. And uh, they're not dissimilar in the sense that they've made their own money. They've yeah. made their own way. People laughed at them at times. They've had failure. They've had great success. They walk into politics, and they want to know very basic answers to really fundamental questions. Whereas some of the CEOs of these big, influential, highly impressive companies approach these questions completely different. Because they're products of the bureaucracy, and they're hemmed in by the sensitivity department or HR or whatever we're calling it now. And they're coming at every question with huge parts of it cordoned off. Like, don't go there. Don't ask that. Don't say that. You're not allowed to say that. Shut up. Be quiet. Shut up and obey. And whenever you go into a question, knowing that you can't ask the most obvious question, you're never going to get the right solution. So I agree with you completely. I do think that the missing piece in the formula, if the goal is to return us to a stable political system, which I think has to be the goal. We don't I don't want much more of this. The country will break you up. You mean riots in the street and people turning violent? Yeah, and, and, and dis- about union. the general nastiness? Oh, and, well, it's, yeah. this can't go on forever. No, it shouldn't. And I'm conservative in the truest sense, which is, I'm, you know, some change is necessary. A ton of change, you know, has a very high cost. You so have I, to digest it. A hundred percent. And from an evolutionary biological standpoint, we're not, we're not equipped for this much change. And technology is already changing stuff so fast. Anyway, the point is, the missing ingredient in this remedy is the guy who shows up and can actually answer those questions right. and fix it. And that is not Trump. I'm not attacking Trump. I, you know, we're all good at different things. But he's not a government expert. He never would have no, pretended to be No, but this that. needs to be followed by someone who says, in either party, who says, look, I understand the questions that you're raising are, are real questions. You're not a racist for asking the questions. That's like yeah. a totally fair question. Yeah. And here's what the answer is, and here's what we're going to do. As soon as we get someone like that, 
using Trump's questions, then we'll be in much better shape. And my fear is that the people in charge on both sides have been totally unwilling to engage. So like Paul Ryan, who I should stipulate is the best person in the world. He's yeah, a, truly a virtuous man. A great man. human being, yeah. He's you, you've going, known him for a long he's time. He's going to heaven, and, and we're not, but he'll try to argue uh, on our behalf when he gets there. But he the other day said, he was asked about Trump's plan to end birthright citizenship yes, and he executive weighed right in. order. And he immediately weighed in. He's obviously for mass immigration, whatever. But he said, obviously that can't work. And I just thought, just from having spent, you know, 16 years in schools, whenever an authority figure prefaces a sentence with obviously, what they're really saying is, You dummy. I'm not yeah. bothering to explain my thinking to you. Because it's too basic. Yeah. yeah. What do you mean, obviously? Why is it obvious? Why don't you explain it to me? And I don't mean to single out Paul Ryan, but that is a, a mindset. Obviously, that won't work. Really, why is it? How about this? I've got an IQ of 80. Why don't you speak slowly and try to... Inform me. But I'm more partisan than you are, right? So I come up from Republican ranks. Don't look at me like that's crazy. That's no, no, crazy. I mean, it's totally not, crazy. no. But the thing is that's frustrating sometimes about our party leaders is that we do tend to preach first and listen yeah. second. And that's why an issue of the economic issues that you're raising or immigration, yeah. they seem so shell-shocked when they've lost the entire country. They certainly lost their party. They've lost this, this center-right coalition. When they've lost the country on some of their positions of things. Look, we are in a democracy. You have to sell the ideas. I think that's good, by, by the definition. Way. I think it's good. You have to convince You have people. a television show. You have to get viewers. If you have no viewers, you don't have a television show. Same for a politician. Of course. But my... Look, it's even more central to the political realm because the legitimacy, the power, derives directly from the consent of the governor. There's no other... So in a monarchy... This is what the Saudi monarchy is actually pretty stable despite all the drama going on now because it's rooted in... Theology. Mm-hmm. So it's like, well, why are you in charge, MBS? And it's like, because I'm directly descended from the prophet, and you're not. And so God put me in charge. And most people, as bizarre as that sounds to the Western mind, in real life, most people kind of get that. They're like, oh, God put you in charge. Okay, therefore you're in charge. A democracy is inherently unstable. And this was, that's why we didn't have any democracies between the Roman Republic and ours for 2,000 years. Because they're tough. They're very tough. And because the legitimacy question is always up in the air, because the legitimacy only comes from the governed. Mm -hmm. And so the second you're not representing the governed, it's like, where did you get the right not to represent the governed? Like, where does that come from? And the truth is, it it doesn't come from anywhere. You're making it up. It becomes tyranny, actually. The second the population isn't on board, you're ruling illegitimately by the rules of your own system. So it's... You really have to pay attention to what voters Or you could think. be, you know, I, I, as I said, I think Donald Trump is an entrepreneur who an, on, brings that entrepreneurism to politics. Ronald Reagan understood that he had to go sell it. He had to go sell his policies. They called him Teflon, right? The Teflon president because they said, hey, the negative stuff doesn't stick. His policies are unpopular. But people seem to oh, like no. him personally. The fact is, is he went out and sold the ideas. Uh, Trump is not like Reagan as a person. He's a totally different kind of person. But he does understand that if you are not hooked up to I the agree. people on these issues, you're wasting your time. Well, so but this is a, that understanding is a prerequisite for leadership in a democracy. And the mistake that the current crop of leaders, the dumb people really still operating most of the leverage I think you power, call them fools. Yeah, I mean, I really mean to approach this with pure contempt because that's what I have okay. after 49 sure. years of living among them. Yeah. I really mean this. And I'm not a populist, to be totally clear. Yeah. I'm an elitist. Yeah. I just believe in impressive elites, yeah. and we don't have them. But the mistake they make is the mistake that a lot of parents and employers and military officers also make, which is you can force the people below you to obey indefinitely. And the truth is you can't. Can't. You can't do it with your own children. Mm -hmm. You can make your kids do whatever you want. Wear a funny hat. I'm I'm commanding you to wear a Viking hat to school. But, Dad, they're going to be mean to me. I don't care. I'm your dad. I'm making you. But then they turn 18. Mm -hmm. And if you have ruled through fear and force with your own kids, what happens? Even at 18, like they go crazy. They wind up in rehab, they hate you. Like you can't do it forever. And so what you're seeing now, all these questions have been raised. Why are we doing it this way? That's what the population is asking when they elect Donald Trump. And the people in charge are like, shut up, racist. Shut up. So what is that? No one believes that most Americans, it's, we're too literal. It has nothing to do with racism. It's just a cover. What they're really saying is, shut up and do what you're told. And my only point is, not just that's annoying, which obviously it is, but it's not sustainable. 
You can't keep doing that forever right. before people are like, you know, I don't care what you call me. Yeah. I'm not going along. They will rebel. By the way, it gets They'll covered to the people that really are hateful in their hearts and that you glom everybody all together yeah, and it, calling and these it, people. But at a certain point, you're like, can I keep track of what people think of in their hearts? Is that even knowable? No, it's not. In the end, like, what is this? Yeah. I mean, is that really my, you know, that's kind of God's job, actually. Yeah. What I can ask of you is certain behavior. I can tell you it's acceptable to do this right. and not acceptable to do that. What I can't do in a free society is force you to believe something because your conscience is your own. Mm-hmm. I'm not in charge of your beliefs. I, I can't be I'm or else it's totalitarian. Not. Exactly. So let me ask you this question. Conservatism, being a conservative, would you call yourself a conservative? Yeah, I mean, I guess. Well, I mean, how, I, how would I you... intensely dislike so many conservatives, but I think I really am conservative. I'd like to get into that. Yeah. But the, uh, wh- how would you define it? How do you explain it? I don't know. I mean... From my perspective, my own beliefs are rooted in the life that I live mm-hmm. and the life that I want my children to live. So I begin with, what do I think is most important? Well, my family's the most important thing. Way more important than my country or anything abstract is my family. It's my wife and four kids. That's what I care about more than anything. And then I do care about my country and I care about a lot of things, but I care about my family first. So from my perspective, a conservative worldview would start there. What are the policies that make it most likely that people can form happy, stable families and exist as I've existed. I've had a really happy life. I want my children to have the same and their children too. So what are the policies that I can support that can make that happen? I feel like in D.C., conservatives have decided that market capitalism or whatever the Cato Institute is pushing is a religion. Now, I happen to think market capitalism works, and it allows lots of choice. and it Very practically effective. Yes, and it generates a huge amount of prosperity that's knowable and known. But it's not a religion. It's a means. It's a tool that we use to achieve certain goals. What are the goals? Well, my goals are always bourgeois. I'm a bourgeois character. I don't seek to live in a plural marriage in the south of France. I want to live in my stupid suburban neighborhood in Washington, D.C. and drive my kids to school. That's really what I want. That's, like, that's honestly my, my heart's desire. And I think there are a lot of people like me, probably the majority, and that's all they want. And they just want to be able to send their kids so to summer what I camp. hear in this answer is part of being a conservative is this idea that you, not by breaking the law or doing extravagant things, you get to kind of chart your own course. You get to figure out who and what you want to be, yes, the kind the, of life you want to live. That's tr- of course that's true. The, the choice, the freedom, I agree with all of that. But it's in my, at least in my reading, it's a little bit deeper in that I believe that there's a continuity of human civil, in human civilization. So, like, people live a certain way, like monogamy. You know, it's been around a long time. Yeah. You know, you marry one person, you kind of stay married. Well, why is why are they doing that? I don't believe that human institutions arise for no reason. Right. Not all of them are good, by the way. We've had slavery around the world for sure. since the beginning of time. It's totally wrong. I'm always against it. But but there is a reason. There's a reason for everything. It's not random. Trump's election was not random. People do things for a reason, even if they don't know what the reason is. It actually made a lot of sense when you had perspective. It, on that's it. right. Yeah. And, and it made sense to me in January of 16. I thought he was going to be elected for those. Nothing to do with him, just the forces. Anyway, the point is a conservative worldview would take account of what people actually want as expressed by what they do, yeah. Yeah. not by what they should want. And I feel like everything has gotten think tank world is so abstract you literally have, and I've worked in Think Tank World. I mean, I've been here for 34 years, so I know the way the city works. And I've seen people have debates like, well, you know, that's inconsistent with the, the tenets of capitalism. And I'm like, I don't worship capitalism. I worship God, like, or whatever. I'm a Christian, yeah. but leaving that aside, this is not a religion. It's a mechanical, you know what I mean? So people can have better Structure. lives. Exactly yes. right. But if your system is making it impossible for my children to get married— then I am totally happy to set your system on fire yeah. and blow it up. Because what is the point? To serve the system? I'm yes. not serving a system. I'm serving my children. Yeah. So um, I'm very distrustful of abstractions. Very. Especially as I get older. I don't like them. Well, I've got a plan. That Oh, shut up. Yes. Do you know what I mean? I've never totally. met anybody smart enough to pull off your yeah. dumb plan. Yeah. You know, we're going to turn a rock into Belgium. Really? Okay, yeah, I bet you are. Dumbo. I often say God didn't give me the highest IQ, but it's an IQ high enough to understand if that makes sense or not. Exactly. And I think that's uniquely American. We want to know, is it going to help people? Is it going to solve the problem? Yes. And if we can't talk in that way, we might be wasting a lot of oxygen. I totally agree. And, yeah. and by the way, all decisions, whether in your personal or professional life or in our political world, ought to be approached with a baseline humility, mm-hmm. which is to say with the knowledge ever present 
that we have limited power and we can't actually foresee the consequences of what we're doing now. And we think we can. We could be right. We might be wrong. But humility, hubris is the humility. enemy yeah. Yeah. of wise decision making. Mm-hmm. And you whine, well, I know what we're going to do. We're going to engineer it. And here's where it's a Rube Goldberg machine. And the, you know what I mean? The marble drops into the spoon, which flips over, goes out of the water wheel, and the toast pops out of the toaster. It's like, you don't know what's going to happen. Let's just start there. You don't really know. And I get all these people on my show all the time, like, well, we know that. Really, what do we know? I don't know if I'm going to wake up alive tomorrow morning. So stop with the we know thing. Mm-hmm. You don't know squat, son, because you're a human being. You're not in control of life or death. And I do think that one of the reasons that people are so emotionally invested in abortion, many people who are in me- invested emotionally in abortion would never have one, by the way. They think it's disgusting. Mm-hmm. But they would lay down their life for you to have one. Well, why is that? Because it is the physical expression of their core belief that man is God, mm-hmm. that we do have control over life yeah. and death. And I think a, a person who doesn't believe that begins with the understanding that the one thing we're not in control of is death. We're not. We can't. You can't really extend your life. Well, if you can't even extend how long you live, then what are you really in charge of? And the answer is nothing, really. Like, I can decide what to have for lunch, but beyond that, like, a lot of it's beyond my power. If you keep that in mind always, you will never go too far wrong, I think. uh, It's tantalizing. You talked about whether or not you were a conservative. You gave a definition. Right, right. But But then you said, I don't know, because there's so many conservatives I don't like. You spent a little ink in your book on that. Uh, Look, t- talk not, to me about that because you're not you know, you're a fair minded person you're not looking to go after people but you're honest about this kind of big food fight that has happened among certain conservatives yeah and I guess I just want, bigger than a food fight really it is if it is and I just think that you should be honest about yourself I really believe that I've made a ton of dumb decisions in my life I've had tattoos removed I mean I've really made you want to say where no just I'm gonna, just okay. half kidding but <laughs> I mean, you know, I used to drink too much. I supported the Iraq War. I mean, I've done so many dumb things. So I'm not standing here being like, I'm really smart and you're not. I don't feel that and, way. And for you, look, as a young guy, it's all on tape. 100%. Well, I, so that, that's the hard part. <laughs> that's a, I you're, can't deny it. I've been doing this since my 20s. No, it's totally true. When I'm in, and I hold my, my kids, most of us as parents do hold our kids to the same standard. The question is not, are you going to screw up? Of course you are. A lot. The question is, do you admit it or do you lie about it? And do you learn something from it, or do you proceed as if it never happened? And I think that's a fair standard to which to hold our policymakers. And so I know the people who've come up with a lot of really bad decisions, some of which I supported at the time. You, you mentioned Max Boot and Bill Crystal in the book, Max too. Max Boot is, is not a... You know, he's an idiot, okay? Crystal's not an idiot. He's a moderately Your former high, boss. My former boss. And how Would you have described him as a mentor at some point? You were close to him. He wasn't a mentor, yeah. but he... And I was never close to him. But I liked him, mm-hmm. and he hired me, most important. I'm Maybe I should say you respected him. Totally. Yeah. And he's clever and kind of a humane guy, and he was a very good boss. I will say yeah. that. Bill Crystal was a really good boss. And just kind of libertarian by temperament, you yeah. know, just kind of let you do right. what you needed to do. And I would say, you know, I've got all these kids, and he'd be like, I can't pay you more, but you can take a side job. He was always really nice to me. Mm-hmm. I don't think he really liked me, but he was fair to me. Anyway, and I think he's... He's hardly a genius, but he's not stupid. No, he has high verbal aptitude and everything. And he had all these theories about the Middle East, which sounded a tiny bit far-fetched to me, but not insane. And I thought, well, he knows a lot more about that, which he did, than I do. So I'm not even holding him, you know, I don't think that he should, you know, be sent to prison for any of that at all, because I agreed with some of it. What I'm enraged by, though, is the unwillingness of him and people like him to just acknowledge the obvious truth, which was we were wrong. Completely wrong. Completely wrong. And in our next round of decision-making... By the way, wrong in the Middle East and wrong about domestic politics as well. Well, completely. And again, I I, I don't want to be self-righteous because I hate that in people. We all have the impulse to be self-righteous, and I don't want to be that person. So I've been wrong, too, a lot. But after... The results are so obvious. They're demonstrable. There's really no debate about this being a bad idea. Why don't you try and figure out what the lessons might have been of that decision and apply them to the next decision and not pretend that it never happened simply because you don't want to concede that you were wrong? And so just to be very precise about it, that's what enrages me. And the fact that, and it's not just Bill Crystal. I mean, he's a buffoon, honestly, at this point, and I don't want to pile on or make it worse for him. His whole life has collapsed. But there are a lot of other people who still retain positions of power. John Bolton would be one of them, honestly, who I don't think have ever learned anything from their mistakes. And why wouldn't I be mad about that? These are people with a lot of power 
whose salaries the rest of us are paying, and they have an obligation to do better. Mm -hmm. That's my opinion. So nothing against John Bolton. He's fine. But, like, he should just admit, I supported all these things that turned out to be disasters, and I'm sorry, A, and B, here's what I've learned, and he never has. That would be a, that would be a fascinating interview. You should have him on your show. I have. I had him on my yeah. show. And you know what he said? What? Ooh, I guess you're the foreign policy expert now. And I'm like, no. Yeah. I'm not the foreign policy expert. You are, so maybe you should just acknowledge that your decisions have been very unwise and tell me what you learned. One of the big changes with this administration over the last Republican administration seems to be a recalibration of what it means to have a strong military force. Do we go everywhere and do everything, or do we press pause as often as we can? One of the interesting things in the book you bring up is Jimmy Carter warts and all for all of his weaknesses. (laughs) You know, the one thing you might have done right— is to not constantly use the military all over the globe. I wish the the rescue mission had gone better. We all do. But he was a little more careful when it came to using the military. He's the only president, I think, in the 20th century uh, to not wage war during his four years in office. And by the way, the public hated him. (laughs) You know, okay. I mean, but for a lot of other reasons that were well deserved. That's, that's true, but yeah. I also think no. I think politicians. One of the reasons we have a lot of rally around wars, the flag. Kind yeah, of, that you yeah. get a lot out of it in the short mm-hmm. term. If you're a day trader and you're thinking about how to spike your popularity right. preparatory to the next election, it works. But I, I, you know, and by the way, I'm not an isolationist. And the typical dumb person response to this critique is, "What are you an isolationist like Charles Lindbergh? Well, you look, don't think I, we should have fought the Nazis?" It's like, no. Look, I worked not. with President Bush. Mm-hmm. And all of us who worked with President Bush, obviously I was more on the political side, so we weren't making geopolitical decisions on war and peace, which is good. But by the same token, we all have to understand that history is a tough judge. Of and we'll see how those decisions will see will be seen in the scope of time. And this it's really sobering for folks. I think it's one of the reasons why President Bush kind of left the stage. He made some pretty big decisions. He had a lot of, lot of criticism on the decisions he made. Yes. And he walked away. I happen to think there's a little bit of grace to that. You were president, you made the tough calls, and you walked away. I totally agree. Why can't Democrat presidents ever leave us? They, it's, like, it's like they're doing Oprah, and they're, they're still giving speeches that are televised, and it's like, oh, my gosh. There was no kind of idea that, look, I had my chance, I had my time in the spotlight, and now it's time to just go be an American. Let me just say one thing about George W. Bush, who I have criticized a lot on the basis of policy. I, I, I see him, you know, occasionally once a year or something, and um, just, just living in America. And um, my, and I'm not an intimate at all, but my strong sense is that he is very burdened by the consequences yeah, of decisions he I would made. Agree. And I, you know, I don't know what his beliefs are right now, but I think he feels the weight of those consequences. And he has spent an, I think his primary, his primary hobby now is painting pictures of wounded warriors That's and right. sending them yeah. to him. What does that tell you? It tells you that this is a guy who's brooding about, ruminating on his decisions. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's what responsible people do, that's actually. What do. It's what decent people do. Yeah. I don't agree with a lot of things that he did, but I think that speaks well of his character. And also staying out. Like, look, you can guess what he thinks about a lot of things, or maybe not. But he's not lecturing the rest of us because he served two terms and now it's over. I think Democrats approach politics very differently from Republicans in general. It's their religion. It's everything. I think that's right. It's everything. It's their heartbeat. Whereas so, for most Republicans, when you get that Statue of Liberty on your check, you're like, I hope this is temporary. Yeah. And I get back into the private economy. Well, yeah, because the goal of your life is, I don't know, raise a decent family or do well at work or you know serve the God that you believe in or whatever. And politics is the thing that you do to make space for those things. Yeah. I think, not for all Democrats, of course, but for the activist base of the Democratic Party, politics is the point. Wielding power is the point. And I think that points up the basic temperamental difference between the left and everyone else, is the left feels powerless without political power. Yeah. And it's one of the reasons Trump has made them so hysterical. It's not that Trump is right-wing. He's in no sense right-wing in a way that we would have recognized five years ago. He's the most liberal Republican ever elected, by far, on everything. It's not a left-right thing. It's that he took power away from the left. They cannot control him. No one can control Trump. Nope. His own staff can't control him, as you know. And so they feel deeply threatened by that because they feel disempowered. If they don't have political power, they don't have any power. And they know they can't That's get how to they him. feel. They've been able to get to other Republicans. No, they could they make can't. The, Trump They is... could make them stop. They could, make, they could shame them in the pages <laughs> totally of the agree. New York Times. Like, where this is rough. I don't know how much rougher it could get for President Trump before he'd say, like, wow. Maybe, well, like, uh, maybe I need to change it up. I don't think he's going to do it. It's totally true. And, <laughs> and Trump, like all, I mean, this is like true of all people, but, you know, your strength is your weakness and vice versa. Yeah. And so 
Trump's weakness is that he's obstinate and doesn't listen to other people and doesn't care what you think and is just going to say these things and no one can control him. Obviously a weakness. Hurts his numbers, hurts the Republican Party. It's also his strength. Totally. Because nobody else would have the huevos to say obviously true things. Like, why don't we have borders? Or like, these people are not impressive. Why are they coming in? It's like, you're not allowed to say that. They're not sending their best people. It's totally true. <laughs> totally true. Yeah. So like, it's not, whatever. The best people aren't. Shut up, racist. Okay. <laughs> so let me let me let me transition to another thing we kind of touched on, which is the kind of modern American CEO uh, who seems to be more uh, involved in their doing their hair and the jacket they wear for the big announcement and the and the great press they're getting about how socially uh, progressive they are and what a great working environment they have in their company, but yet profits. And is their company going to be around next week? Not so much. It doesn't matter. What's what's going on there? The I whole mean, country why are they run- taking these political positions on things that don't impact their company? Why are they taking these salaries right. when their companies are tanking? Marissa Mayer got rich by destroying Yahoo. I mean, w- the feng shui is out of whack. How much did she make? She made Oh, I don't have. I mean, I went and got right into it in the book. and Tens of millions of dollars. Oh, yeah. hundreds of millions yeah. for wrecking the company. Now, I'm sure there are lots of factors that destroyed Yahoo. It wasn't just her, but she was the head of it, okay? But when your company isn't profitable, why are you making anything as a CEO? You should probably just make, like, your base salary. So this That's is a case it. that liberals used to make. Like, make I, a lot if your company's doing great? Make nothing if your company's going bankrupt. But also the differential between the highest and lowest paid employee in a company, liberals always, always used to talk about that, and conservatives would be like, oh, shut up. Stop with your fairness talk. Which, okay, I used to say that, too. But now that liberals and institutional conservatives are united in advancing the agenda of the Chamber of Commerce, they really are on immigration mm-hmm. and wages and all this stuff, nobody is saying that. So there's no pushback. So the system is out of balance. Like somebody needs to stand up and say, wait a second, explain to me why you deserve all this money. What are you, a socialist? No, actually, I'm a capitalist. You're discrediting capitalism by your greed, a word that Republicans feel they're not allowed to use because it violates the catechism or something. I don't care. And, you know, I don't work for anybody other than Fox News. They let me say whatever I want, and that's greedy. What you're doing is greedy. You mm-hmm. did not create value. You're looting the company, and everyone else is like, oh, you're a pioneer because of your race or gender or some other irrelevant criterion. Like, who cares? You're a bad steward of the company, and you're shafting everyone below you, including shareholders. Why are, you, why are we for this? Or they did that you can come into a company where people have worked for generations and to maximize profits for a short-term period to the benefit of a tiny group of private equity investors, you close the company down and put everyone out of work and we're not allowed to say anything because that's capitalism. Be quiet. You don't understand markets. It's like, okay, you're evil. Be quiet. These people's lives matter. It is a balance. I'm not saying you employ people at a loss forever. I'm not making that case. But what I am saying emphatically is their lives are not irrelevant. That's got to be one of the factors that you take into account. So in some of these high-tech companies, you have CEOs that actually the profits are real question about the really are there really profits number two exactly. they're making outrageous amounts of money they're called innova- innovators which allows them to cover up all the all innovator. the wounds <laughs> and finally they're making a huge impact on our society that we don't fully understand are you someone that looks at this and says hey maybe the government needs to scrutinize this like what's the next step i wouldn't say scrutinize it i would say break up the companies immediately that's and more than start scrutiny putting right people on trial. yeah, yeah. That's, uh, that's what I, I feel that way and I guess that's another they're, they're essentially monopolies. This is exactly they what are, Teddy Roosevelt are, was talking about. Right. Google on search is, is literally a monopoly. Like 90% plus, 95% Yes, and they plus. all have carve-outs from the Congress that allow them to pretend they're and not. And they're taking all of our personal information of and course. they're warehousing it and using it for their well, Right, they're purposes. not even they're not even American companies. I right. mean, these are multinationals who are owned, a lot of them are owned by sovereign wealth funds of nations that hate us. So these are foreign entities in our midst, literally. They're not American in any recognizable sense. And yet they have almost total control over all human information right. in English. So why are they not a threat to democracy? Well, obviously they are. Yeah. And nobody and they will definitely s- have a political point of view. And that's the thing that's frightening. So but realize. where where are all the conservatives who are right. spo- you know supposed to be protecting like normal people? They're like, well, it's the market or that you know, the junior senator from Utah who's the chairman, I think, of the Senate, you know, antitrust subcommittee. I asked him, he's a you know, smart guy, nice guy, I'm not attacking him personally, but it was like, if Google isn't a monopoly, then maybe we should redefine the term. And he's like, oh no, it's the, it's the free market. If you just throw the term free market at a conservative, it's like kryptonite to Superman. It's like, no, I'm melting, stop, right. free market, I'm not right. against that. It's like, I don't care about your, di- if this is, a free, this is a free market, Google's a free market, 
No, it's not. Yeah. It's a totally creepy monopoly. Well, I that... think there's more to come on the top. Look, we, I need another hour with you, but I have to ask you this Are question. Are we out of time? We're getting close. Oh, my gosh. I have to ask you this question because, you know, talk about the free market and the fact that you don't believe in the mo- monarchy, although you did say you're an elitist. I have this question about your family. Yeah. Four kids. Yeah. They're really all out of the house. Yeah. But you can be a little bit. You have some pretty tough rules with your family. I hear that you don't like wheels on suitcases. Is this true? Who told you that? <laughs> I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Is it true? Yeah, I've been, you know what? You the, believe that you take the bag and you put it over your shoulder and you get on the plane. Or I can't believe someone told you that. Yes, that is true. Um, I don't have a ton of rules. Actually, I'm very kind of laissez-faire, and so is my wife in the way we've raised our kids. Well, carrying your bag is not lazy, I'll tell you that much. Well, my view was, so I have three daughters, and they're, you know, I just love them. I talk to them all every day, and I think they're wonderful, and one son. But my girls, plus my wife's, so those four, tend to overpack when we travel. Yes. And so my rule has always been, as really? someone who's traveled like full-time for 25 years, is you can't bring anything that you can't run with through DFW I okay, to miss a late flight. Totally. No wheels. And, and they were like, that's crazy, but they abided by it. Because I don't ask them to do a lot. I'm not like, you have to believe what I believe politically. or You don't have to do anything. Okay, you can order whatever you want off the menu. I, I'm really pretty liberal with my kids. No wheels. Because we have dignity, something called human dignity. Have yeah. you heard of that? Yes. Self-respect? Yeah. I'm not going to drag my bag like an animal. I'm right. going to carry it like a, like a human being. It all worked until my oldest child was 18, and she went to London for the summer to work. And we met her on the French side. She came through the channel. I'll never forget it. In the Gare du Nord, standing there waiting for my daughter to come through. And she's pulling a wheeled suitcase. <laughs> And I said, where did you get that? And she said, Uncle Hodge, who's her godfather, my best friend, business partner, college roommate. She had to bring up God. That might have been the only thing. (laughs) (laughs) No, Uncle Hodge is his name. I'm not going to tell you his real name, but that's what she calls him. Anyway, he had totally undercut my authority as the patriarch and given her this rolling suit. So that was the beginning of the end. I mean, that was when the dam starts to collapse. And all of a sudden, the next time I'm in an airport with my kids, it's like I've got my son who's dutifully carrying his duffel bag. And then I've got four girls with, like, hot pink roller bags. That's and I'm awesome. like, you know what? See, we do it's need over. A, we do need another hour. This went fast. This was awesome. It's a great book. They subverted the patriarchy over the rolling <laughs> they bags. They did. They did. <laughs> that's, that's just the beginning. Once you have know, grandkids, know, it's going to get know. worse. Thanks, uh, for, thanks for being with us. Tom. Thanks for doing that. that. I appreciate it. Good to see yeah. you, Matt. Thank you. This year, Book TV marks our 20th year of bringing you the country's